So today we'll be talking about modular arithmetic and the things we talk about today. Um, not only will they be very important in future classes, but it'll build upon the stuff that we sort of talked about uh, on Tuesday. Okay, so it's all very related and hopefully you'll see some of the connections here today. Okay, just a couple announcements. Um, so one, the quiz scores have come out. I believe they were released uh, after class on Tuesday, right? Was everyone able to see their quiz two score? Cool, okay. Um, if you, for whatever reason, need a regrade request, uh, I believe they're open, so you can submit that um, however you submit them for other classes, just on Gradescope. And if you wanted to you know, talk to me personally about how your performance is in the class, you didn't do so well on the quiz or this or that, um, that's fine, just reach out to me and we can set up a time or talk in office hours. Okay, also, I believe the in-lecture question on Tuesday was, do you want homework deadlines moved to Sunday? And the overwhelming majority answer was yes. So um, I'll probably do that. Okay, so homeworks will be, they'll come out sometime in the weekend before and then due Sunday, 11.59. Does that sound okay? Um, yeah. So you're asking, what about the current deadline of homework five? Yeah, that'll probably be moved as well. So instead of being due March 4th, 15th, I guess, we can push it back to March 17th. And I can update that in the worksheet and the website. Is that clear? So homeworks will be due on Sundays now. <coughs> Any other questions logistically about what's going on? Okay, also I should add, um, now there's also a textbook section for 3.2. So basically everything we'll talk about today um, will also be reflected in the textbook. I just pushed it like uh, maybe like 10 minutes ago. So it's all there as well. Okay, and feel free to reach out if you have any issues with the textbook as well. Okay, so just to recap some of the things we talked about on Tuesday, we reintroduced the idea of divisibility, uh, this notation that we've been seeing throughout the course. A divides B. Well, what does that mean? It just means B is some multiple of A. Okay? And again, um, number theory, we're primarily talking about integers. Um, and most of the time, we're specifically talking about natural numbers or whole numbers. Okay, so um, I guess in a broader sense, we can say integers, right? If we weren't talking about integers, then we could say any number divides any other number. You see what I mean by that? Like, if we weren't restricted to the set of integers, I could say 5 divides 24 because I can say 24 is equal to 5 times 24 over 5. But the issue is this scalar that I'm multiplying by 5 to get 24 is not an integer, right? So if we don't restrict ourselves to the integers, you can multiply um, by anything. Right? You can, and most times it'll be a rational number. So that's why we want to stick just talking about integers. Okay? We also talked about the division algorithm, which says if we're dividing some uh, dividend A by some divisor D, we can always write the relationship as A is equal to divisor times quotient plus remainder, where the remainder is always between zero and the divisor, but strictly less than the divisor. So the remainder always is zero, one, two, dot, 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 D minus one. All right, and this is an idea you've seen before. When you divide by three, the possible remainders are zero, one, two. Divide by 10, the possible remainders are zero, one through nine. Is that clear? Okay, so when you divide by n, the possible remainders are 0 through n minus 1 inclusive. Okay, we also talked about the fundamental theorem of arithmetic, which states that every positive integer has a unique prime factorization. Um, we talked about canonical representations of numbers, so writing numbers in the form like p is equal to, or let's just say, um, n is p1 to the a1, p2 to the a2, dot, 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 pk to the ak, where these are primes. And the exponents tell us how many of each prime we're including in our product. And we also talked about, excuse me, the ideas of the greatest common divisor and lowest common multiple. The greatest common divisor, we would be taking the minimum of pairwise exponents and the lowest common multiple, we take the maximum uh, pairwise exponents. Okay? Um, and an important takeaway that I think you should have by now is that, for example, if we're considering all of the possible divisions of the integers uh, when they're divided by 4, we can say that all integers can be written in the form 4q, 4q plus 1, 4q plus 2, or 4q plus 3. And that applies for any integer. 
right? It's just like when we consider odd or even, right? Odd or even is just what we get when we divide by two. So we can say all integers can either be written as 2k or 2k plus one. Is that clear? Any questions with this? Okay. Also, just a couple, a couple of common misconceptions I think you should be aware of. If A divides B times C, it does not imply that A divides B or A divides C. Okay, so for example, A divides the product, or 12, sorry, divides the product of 4 and 9, right? Because 12 divides 36. But 12 does not divide 4, and 12 does not divide 9. Okay, so just because some number divides the product of the other two numbers, it doesn't mean it has to divide one of the individual ones. Is that clear? The first point. And the second, if A divides some integer power of B, it doesn't imply A divides B. And so an example of that is here, 12 divides 6 squared, but 12 does not divide 6. Right, because 6 squared is 36, and 36 is a multiple of 12. 6 is not a multiple of 12. <coughs> Any questions with this? So now we'll start diving into formal modular arithmetic. Okay, so there are two like examples of things that you're already aware, with, aware of, sorry, um, that will sort of help explain this idea. Okay, so the first is the concept of odd numbers and even numbers. Okay, if the only property of numbers we care about is whether they're odd or even, you agree that there are really only two numbers that exist. What are they? Okay, so you're saying... 2k and 2k plus 1. So you're on the right track. But let's suppose the only property we care about is if a number is odd or if it's even. Okay? We can think of all numbers as being equivalent to either box or either triangle. What are box and triangle? Yeah. Zero and one. Right? Because odd and even is really just... Um, the remainder when you divide by 2, right? If a number is even, it just tells you the remainder is 0 when you divide by 2. And if the number is odd, it tells you it just has a remainder of 1 when you divide by 2. Is that clear? So odd and even, so odd just means remainder 1 when, that's a bad 1. And even is just remainder zero when you divide by two, okay? So what we can say is that all of these numbers, seven, three, negative 13, 57, we can say in terms of whether or not they're odd or even, they're all equivalent to the number one. And this triple equal sign means equivalent. Is that clear? All odd numbers are equivalent to the number one. Similarly, all even numbers, so for example, four, negative 16, 22, dot, dot, those are all equivalent to zero. For the purposes of, are these numbers odd or are they even, right? And in terms of doing arithmetic, we can make these simplifications. Okay, so for example, if we wanted to evaluate 15 plus 13 times 22, and we want to know if that result is odd or even, okay, well, I can just make these simplifications as I go. So is 15 odd or even? Odd, right? So I can replace it with a 1. Is 13 odd or even? Odd, so that's a 1, and 22 is uh, even, so that's a 0. So now I just have 1 plus 1 times 0. Okay, what does that give me? Um, that gives me one, 1 plus 0, which is just 1. So it tells me that this result will be odd as well. Is that clear? Similarly, what if I just did 15 plus, um, why don't we say uh, 73 times 75? <coughs> well, in that case, we'd have 1 plus 1 times 1, which is 2. Right, because 15, 73, and 75 are all odd. But remember, the only numbers a set, like when we're considering odd and even are 0 and 1. Right? So what can we say 2 is equivalent to? 
zero. So we can just say this is equivalent to zero, telling us that the result of that operation is an even number. Is that idea sort of clear? When we're thinking about odd and even, um, for the purposes of this example, the only two numbers that exist are zero or one. Right? Notice the only two numbers that exist when we're thinking about remainders when we divide by two are zero and one. Okay? The other example that often comes up when starting to talk about modular arithmetic is um, the idea of a clock, right? And if, uh, for this example, if, do we have an analog clock anywhere here? No. Okay. Um, it serves best to think about an analog clock, right? You go through, you can think of the 12 o'clock angle being 0 o'clock. Um, we go 0 through 11, and then after we pass 11, we sort of wrap back around to 0 again and start counting again, right? We have zero through 11, zero through 11, so on and so forth, right? This is similar with odd and even, right? We alternate between zero and one. Zero, one, then we wrap back around zero, one, so on and so forth. And so suppose the clock reads six o'clock and you wanna know the time in eight hours, you probably wouldn't say 14 o'clock, right? Unless you're talking about military time, let's ignore that for now. You wouldn't say 14 o'clock, what would you say? Two o'clock. Right? Because after we pass 11, we wrap back around to zero. Is that clear? And you, know, you can draw a little clock. Whatever. Okay? And so, six o'clock, eight hours later, that brings us to two o'clock. Okay? And so notice, when we're looking at a clock, the only possible numbers that exist are 0, 1, 2, all the way through 11. Okay, every time on a clock is equivalent to one of these. And even if you use military time, each of the hours, you know, 12 through 23, are equivalent to one of these, right, 0 through 11. It's just the second time they occur. Is that clear? Yeah. I see what you mean. Um, you can think of it that way, but it really, like, it's just an offset. It really doesn't matter. And in terms of, like, modular arithmetic, it makes a little more sense to think of it as 0 through 11. Because, like, the top is where it resets. It doesn't restart at 1 o'clock, if that makes sense. That'll become more clear when we, like, formalize things. Any other questions? Cool. All right, we raised something. Okay, so let's formalize it. So we say A and B are equivalent, and again, this means equivalent. Another term that you might see out in the wild is congruent. Remember like congruent triangles uh, back in the day. Modulo M, if and only if, M divides the difference between A and B. Okay, so for example, we could say, I don't know, um, 23 is equivalent to 2 modulo 7. Why? Well, because 7 divides the difference of 23 and 2. Because the difference of 23 and 2 is 21, and 21 is a multiple of 7. So modulo 7, we can say the numbers 23 and 2 are congruent or equivalent. Is that clear? A more clear way of thinking about this is that modulo m, two numbers are equivalent, if and only if, they have the same remainder when you divide them by m, right? When you divide 23 by 7, you get the remainder 2. And when you divide 2 by 7, you also get the remainder 2. So the two numbers are equivalent. Is that clear? As another example, modulo 5, we can say 19 is equivalent to 24, which is equivalent to 4, which is equivalent to 1,004. Okay, because all of these numbers, when you divide them by five, you get the same remainder, four. So they're all equivalent modulo five. Is that clear? Any questions with this? Okay, and another way you can phrase this is that if A and B are equivalent, then um, as I mentioned before, M divides the difference of A and B, but you can also algebraically, and we'll do this in some proofs, write it like this. B is equal to A plus some multiple of M. Okay? So for example, 
I can say 23 is equal to 2 plus some multiple of 7. And in that case, k is 3. And remember, this all, all of this only works when we're talking about integers, right? Um, if you allowed rational numbers or whole, uh, real numbers, then none of these nice properties would really mean anything, right? It's possible that I can find an integer k such that 23 is 2 plus k times 7. In that case, or in this case, k is 3, right? <coughs> so any questions with these definitions? And we'll look at several more examples in just a second. Cool. And so I sort of hinted at this in the beginning, but when we're dealing with numbers modulo m, all integers can be reduced or simplified to a number in the set 0, 1, 2, through m minus 1, right? So, uh, for example, if we're looking at integers modulo 3, all numbers are equivalent to 0, 1, or 2, right? Just like a clock, which is modulo 12, all numbers are equivalent to 0 through 11, or odd or even, modulo 2, where all integers are equivalent to 0 or 1, when we're using a general m, so modulo m, all integers are equivalent to 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 through m minus 1. Is that clear? So given any integer, if we're working modulo m, you can always find its like most reduced form or standard form as being the number that's in this set, 0 through m minus 1. Is that clear? Any questions with this? Okay. And so, suppose that A and R are equivalent modulo M. It turns out you can add M as many times as you want, and the equivalence still holds. So what I'm saying is, if, for example, 3 is equivalent to... Uh, Essentially what I'm saying is 3 is equivalent to 8, is equivalent to 13, is equivalent to 18 in modulo 5. I can add 5 as many times as I want, and the remainder when I divide by 5 does not change. Is that clear? And I can also subtract 5 as many times as I want. And this all still holds. Okay? A quick little proof of this fact, if you have a is equal to m times q plus r, I'm saying the remainder when I divide a by m is r, I can add m to both sides, right? a plus m is m q plus r plus m. Well, that's just m times q plus 1 times r. Right, so I'm still writing a plus m as divisor times quotient plus remainder. And you see, the remainder is the same. So if I just add m, the remainder when I divide by m, it doesn't change, okay? And so formally, this entire list here, it's an entire set of numbers, all equivalent to a in modulo m. So I can add m, I can add m twice, I can subtract m, subtract m twice, so on and so forth. All of these numbers in this set are equivalent to A modulo M. Is that clear? So as an example, this entire set right here, all of these numbers are equivalent to 3 mod 5. Okay, so 3, 8, 13, 18, so on and so forth. Um, negative 2, negative 7, negative 12, so on and so forth. All of these numbers are equivalent to one another, and the like most reduced form of them would be 3 modulo 5. Because when you divide any of them by 5, the remainder you get is 3. <coughs> any questions with this? Okay. Also, this note, uh, like, uh, this implies that you can think of negative integers as also having um, equivalences, right? Like negative 12 and 3 are equivalent. Right? This is fine because we can say 5 divides the difference. Does 5 divide negative 12 minus 3? Yeah, because I can say negative 15 is 
k times 5, where k is some integer. And k in this case would be negative 3. So the formal relationship we looked at before, you know, a and b being equivalent modulo m, if and only if m divides a minus b, that still holds when either a or b are negative. Is that okay? So negative numbers are allowed. But like the thing you should be taking away from this is, really, the only numbers that exist are 0 through m minus 1. And everything is equivalent to one of those numbers. Any questions with that? OK. And so this is another little picture that might help gain some intuition. right? I can start with 0, add 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6. Then once I get back to the top, now I have 7. Okay, then I can add through again, then I have 14. So all of the numbers at each position are equivalent to one another. Right, so all the numbers here, they're all equivalent to 0 modulo 7. These numbers are all equivalent to 1 modulo 7. And so on and so forth. Right? The position on the clock is just the remainder when you divide by 7. One rotation, I get zero through seven or zero through six, then seven through thirteen, then you know fourteen, fourteen through twenty, so on and so forth. So, any questions with this? You can think of it as you know going zero through m minus one, and then rotating back again. So, like, so sometimes if you were to like search this up, you'll see modular arithmetic being referred to as clock arithmetic, just for this reason. Because this is the most standard example is thinking of this in terms of a clock. Is that clear? Okay, so now we want to look at how we can actually do arithmetic simplifications in you know, modulo m. Okay, and something I should note um, in potentially in future classes, um, potentially in other upper division courses. When we're dealing with, like for example, on this slide, all integers modulo 5, you'll see that being represented as z sub 5. Okay, set of integers Okay, so the z with the subscript 5, it's just we're working modulo 5. Okay, in um, for example, in math 113, if you end up taking that, this also means the same thing. Okay, z slash 5z. It means you're working with a set of integers modulo 5. Okay, you probably won't see this um, anytime soon, but this one is something you should be aware of. Z sub. Okay. Okay, anyway, suppose we want to simplify 13 plus 14 times 6 modulo 5. So, in other words, find the remainder you get when you... Uh, divide that expression by 5. So there's several ways you could do this. You know, first, you could just take out a calculator, do 13 plus 14 times 6, see what it evaluates to, so which we do first, right? We get to 97, because uh, we have 13 plus 84. 97, that's 2 more than a multiple of 5, so we say that that's 2 mod 5. Great, so that works. But we can also simplify along the way. Okay, so you notice, I can replace the 13 with the 3, the 14 with a 4, and the 6 with a 1. Right? Because 13 is equivalent to 3, modulo 5. 14 is equivalent to uh, 4. And 6 is equivalent to 1. Is that clear? So I can say that this just really evaluates to 3 plus 4 times 1, which is 7, which also simplifies to 2. Is that clear? Or I could even also say, well, 13 is 2 less than the next biggest multiple of 5. So 13 is also equivalent to negative 2 mod 5. Okay? So when you're doing these simplifications, you can either change it to a positive number or a negative number, right? Because all of these numbers are equivalent, and as long as your end result is one of the numbers 0, 1, 2, 3, or 4, you know that number will always be correct. Right? So I can change 13 to negative 2. I can honestly even change 14 to negative 1. Right? I could have done negative 2 plus negative 1 times 1, which will give me negative 3, but conveniently, that's also 2, right, mod 5. And if my end result is not 
zero, one, two, three, or four, I just subtract five or add five as many times as I need to until it is in that range, right? Because all of those numbers are equivalent. Negative three and two are the exact same number modulo five, okay? It's just the, like, you know, when you report your answer when doing these kinds of calculations, the one that just makes the most sense, like the standard form, um, is the one in the range zero, one, two, three, four. Is that clear? So the main takeaway of this is regardless of, you know, the order in which you do the simplification, the standard form result, so like you know, the end result, always ends up being the same. Any questions? Great. And so it turns out that in general, if A and B are equivalent and C and D are equivalent modulo M, then you can add A plus C and get B plus D. And you can multiply A and C and get B times D. Okay, so this really tells you it doesn't matter the order in which you do these simplifications. If two numbers are equivalent, their sums will be equivalent. And uh, sorry, not not too like uh, if you have two equivalences, we can sort of add them and multiply them. If that's clear. Okay, and so here we have a proof of the first rule. So here's the proof of the addition one. Prove that if A and B are equivalent, C and D are equivalent, then B plus D is equivalent to A plus C. Okay, and that's sort of what we did. We said, well, if A is equivalent to B, then I can say B is A plus some scalar multiple of M. Right, that's what I'm saying here. If A and B are equivalent, mod M. I can say B is A plus some scalar multiple of M. And if C and D are equivalent, mod M, then I can say D is C plus some <coughs> scalar multiple of M. And again, these scalars have to be integers for any of this to have meaning, right? And so pink is not the most transparent color. Why don't we use that, sure. Is that clear? We can say B is A plus M times K, um, K1, and D is C plus M times K2. And notice these constants have to be different. K1 and K2 have to be different. Is that clear? Okay. And so what I'm doing here now is I'm adding my expressions for B and D. So I get B plus D is, and maybe we can write it like this, If I add these two, we get B plus D is A plus C plus M K1 plus K2. Is that clear? And that, it's just the definition of two numbers being equivalent modulo M. Right? It's saying this box is equal to this triangle, or equivalent to this triangle, modulo circle. Or modulo M, sorry. Right? Because the box and triangle, the difference of them is divisible by M. Is that clear? So therefore, the box is equivalent to the triangle mod, uh, mod M. And here, the box was just B plus D, and the triangle was just A plus C. So I showed that I can write B plus D as A plus C plus some multiple of M. And that was the definition we gave, or like part of one of the definitions we gave back here. Right? If A and B are equivalent, I can say B is equal to A plus K times M, where K is some integer. And we did exactly that here. So any questions with the proof of the first property? No? Okay. So I'll give you a couple minutes to discuss all of this um, and come up with a proof of the second property. So notice the first is a proof of this with addition. Second is a proof of this with multiplication. Okay, so I'll give you a couple minutes. This should be a group activity, sort of talk amongst yourselves and we can take it out.
Okay. So recall, our goal is to show that if A and B are equivalent and C and D are equivalent, modulo M, I should be able to say B times D is equivalent to A times C, modulo M. And so a way to phrase this would be, I can write BD as AC plus some multiple of M. Which, so as M triangle, where triangle is an integer. Is that clear? So that's the goal. And so why don't we start off by multiplying our two expressions now. Okay, so the left-hand side will have B times D. Right-hand side will have whatever this thing is. Okay, which gives me AC plus M AK2 plus M K1C plus M squared K1 K2. Is everyone okay with that expansion? And then now, I just can write this as AC plus M times a bunch of other stuff. AK2 plus CK1 plus M K1 K2. And we're done because I've accomplished the goal. I wanted to write BD is equal to AC plus M times some integer. And that's exactly what I did. And so therefore, I can say BD and AC are equivalent. <coughs> is that clear? So the main takeaway of all of this is you can make these simplifications in any order you want. End result will be okay. Cool. Okay, and again, this exact proof is in the textbook as well. So if you want to look back at that, it's there. Okay, and so we've talked about addition, um, which essentially means we also talked about subtraction because it's the same sort of thing. Now we need to talk about, um, or we've talked about addition and multiplication, sorry. We want to talk about exponentiation now. Okay, and so exponentiation, it's not as simple as, so for example, if we have 2 to the 15 mod 9, I can't just say that it means 2 to the 6 mod 9. Right, because in the exponent, what that means is I'm multiplying by itself 15 times. Okay, so that meaning doesn't change when we start, we shift over to modular arithmetic. So you can't say that. Okay. And so suppose we want to evaluate 12, uh, 2 to the 15 modulo 9, okay? We could, you know, write in the calculator, or if you remember, 2 to the 15 is 3, 2, 7, 6, 8, and, you know, divide this by 9, and do the long division and figure out what the remainder is. But, I mean, the whole point of modular arithmetic is that it should simplify some of our calculations. And we'll actually, in a second, look at some proofs that we did before that were relatively involved that um, are essentially trivial now with modular arithmetic. Anyways, what we can see is that 2 to the 15, since 15 is just 3 times 5, I can write 2 to the 15 as 2 to the 3 raised to the 5 by our exponent laws, right? Yes, x to the a to the b is x to the ab, okay? And 2 to the 3 is just 8, but we're talking modulo 9, and 8 is equivalent to negative 1. Is that clear? And so this is a trick that you will use very often in modular arithmetic. Okay? Write n minus 1 as negative 1 uh, mod n. Okay? Okay, and why does this work? Well, we said before you can add or subtract any number of multiples of n, and the equivalence still holds. Right. And so from n minus 1, I could just subtract an n, and it'd still be equivalent to negative 1. Okay? And so we know 8 is negative 1, and if I just substitute in negative 1 for 2 to the 3, and my exponent stays to the 5, I have negative 1 to the 5, and so now I'm looking here, which is just negative 1, right, because the exponent is odd. But negative 1 modulo 9 is just 8. Okay, and so what I was able to do was look at this expression, 2 to the 15 modulo 9, and reduce it to some number um, in the set 0 through 8. So in its standard form, you can think of it, right? And so what this really means is if you went into Python, said 2 star star 15 
percent sine 9, you should expect to get out 8, and you will. Is that clear? And so I replace the 8 with the negative 1. Um, raising 1 or negative 1 to any exponent is pretty easy. And then negative 1 in mod 9 is just 8. So I was able to do that simplification pretty quickly. And I didn't have to you know, divide out 32, 768 by 9 or anything like that. Okay? So I'll give you um, like 30 seconds maybe. Take a look at these following two examples and see if you can figure out the trick on how to exponentiate them. Okay? So the second one's a little easier, right? Because the second one is very similar to the last step of the first one, right? Because I can write 23 as what? Negative 1, right? In modulo 24. And negative 1 to the 9 is just negative 1, which is just 23. So that one's done. 5 to the 11 is slightly trickier. Okay? And what I can do here is I know I can write 11 as 10 plus 1, but 10 is just 2 times 5 plus 1. Okay, so I can actually write 5 to the 11 as 5 squared to the 5 times 5. Okay? And so this sort of seems like it comes out of nowhere, but what is 5 squared? 25, right? Which is just negative 1 when we're thinking of modulo 26. So this just becomes negative 1 to the 5 times 5, which is negative 5, which modulo 26 is just 21. Is that clear? So what you should always be thinking of when you're approached with these problems is, is there any power... Uh, my exponent base that is very close to you know, the mod that we're working in. And so these sorts of tricks, I've gone over a lot of them here, but you'll sort of pick them up um, over time by doing practice. And I believe the homework has a lot of just questions where you have to work on this sort of thing. Okay? And if you really want more practice, you can really just make it up yourself. Right, just pick three numbers, 23 to the 57 mod 32, and just do it. And to see if you're right, go into Python and type in that expression and see what you get. Right? So you can come up with practice for these kinds of things on your own. Sound good? Okay. There's also a nice technique called repeated squaring that you should also be aware of. Okay. In cases where you can't do these nice little tricks. Okay. And it uses the fact that you can write any integer as the sum of different powers of 2. Okay? And that's just a consequence of the ability to write any integer in binary. Right? And we sort of addressed this, I believe, in the first class of the semester. Right? For example, 1011, a 1 is saying I do want to use that, the power of 2 at that spot, and 0 is I don't. Right? So this is the 0 spot, 1 spot, 2 spot, 3 spot. So what this corresponds to is 
yes, I want two to the three. No, I don't want two to the two. Yes, I want two to the one. And yes, I want two to the zero. Is that clear? Yes, no, yes, yes. And so what this is telling me is since I can write any number in binary, I can write any number as a sum of powers of two. Okay, in this case, I believe this evaluates to um, 8 plus 10, that, that's 11, it looks like. Okay? And so what we'll use this, or like how we'll use this, is this idea of repeated squaring, right? Uh, and so, for example, if I want to consider 4 to the 26 modulo 13, I know I can write 26 as 16 plus 8 plus 2. Okay? Which means, since when you... Uh, multiply exponential bases, you add in the exponent. I can write 4 to the 26 as 4 to the 16 times 4 to the 8 times 4 squared. Is that clear so far? Don't look so much at the calculations, but is up to this part clear? Okay, I can write 26 as 16 plus 8 plus um, 2. And so now what I'll do is, notice if I start with 4 to the 1, I can evaluate it. Whatever its result is, I can square it and I'll get 4 to the 2. I, whatever that result is, I can square it and I'll get 4 to the 4. I can square that again and I'll get 4 to the 8. Square that again, I'll get 4 to the 16. And then when I want to build 4 to the 26, I just need to use my results for 4 to the 16, 4 to the 8, and 4 to the 2. And I can simplify as I go. So as an example, let's walk through this, right? So I start off with 4 to the 1, and that's just 4, right? Then my next power of 2 is 2. So 4 squared is 16, but I can reduce 16 to be 3, right? Because we're working modulo 13. Now, <clears throat> the next one I want is 4 to the 8, right? But 4 to the 8 is just 4 squared to the 4 by ex exponent laws. But we know 4 squared in this case is just 3 from our previous line, right? 4 squared is just 3. So this is just 3 to the 4, which we can easily compute to be 81. And modulo 13, um, oops, there's a mistake in here. Uh, 13 times 6 should be 78. Um, yeah, so this should be 3. Okay, because 81, is, it's a relatively small number. It's nothing crazy like 4 to the 8, right? We didn't have to deal with numbers bigger than 100. Um, we have 81, and I can easily reduce that to be 3 in mod 13. Is that clear? Because I know 13, uh, yeah, because 13 times 6 is 78. This is 3 greater than that. Okay, and so I can make these little simplifications as I go, so that I don't need to, um, you know, compute something of the size 4 to the 26. Okay, so this here should be 3, because I made a typo on the previous slide. So this should be 9. Okay, because to get 4 to the 16, I just take my result from 4 to the 8 and square it. And my result from 4 to the 8 was 3, so I square 3, I get 9. And now I have 9 mod 13. Okay? And now I know my result. Um, let's ignore this because there will be typos. Um, 4 to the 16 times 4 to the 8 times 4 to the 2. Well, now I can just read these off um, this little calculation list. So what's 4 to the 16? Well, that's 9 mod 13. So I have 9. What's 4 to the 8? Well, that's 3. And what's 4 to the 2? That's also 3. Okay? And so I've simplified 4 to the 16 into this relatively small calculation. Is that clear? And so now, it's up to me to choose how to further simplify this, right? And so, sure, you could multiply this out and get 81 again, and we know 81 is 3, but a smaller step we could make is, well, what's 9 times 3? 27, right? But we're working mod 13, and 27 is one more than a multiple of 13, right? Because it's one more than 26. This is just 1 times 3, which gives me 3. So I was able to figure out 4 to the 26 modulo 13 without having to 
expand out 4 to the 26. All I had to do was start with 4, square it, square that, square that, square that, simplify each step, and then multiply the ones that I wanted. Is that clear? Sorry for the typos. I'll fix that before it's posted. But is the general idea clear? Cool. And so also on the homework, you'll get practice with this sort of thing as well. And again, this is this sort of idea where you can just come up with an example on your own, work through it, and test it out yourself. Okay, so the idea of repeated squaring is something you should definitely be familiar with. Okay? Cool. And so yeah, this would be a good opportunity to try and work on an example. Okay, so out of interest for time, we probably won't finish this because this one you end up having to do quite a bit of arithmetic. It's nothing crazy like determining 3 to the 37, but you do have to, you know, multiply, know, like divide three-digit numbers, which, I don't know, it's been a while since we've done that probably. Um, so whatever, we have 37, which you can write as 32 plus 4 plus 1. Okay, and the way you compute that is you start off with the largest power of 2, right, which is uh, 32 and then see how much is remaining, 5, and then I apply the process to 5. Okay, so the things I want are 3 to the 1, 3 to the 4, and 3 to the 32. Okay, but along the way, I might end up calculating a bunch of other things. Okay, well, so why don't we start? Okay, so 3 to the 1, that'll just be 3. And I'm not going to keep writing modulo 53, because I think at this point it's understood. Okay, um, 3 squared, well, that's just 9. Doesn't help us that much. 3 to the 4 is the next one we need. Well, that's 9 squared, that's 81, but we can simplify 81 modulo 53. What does it come out to? 30, 28, I believe, right? So 28. Okay, so now we need 3 to the 8. Well, that's just 28 squared, which, okay, see, this is when it becomes annoying. You go over to the side and 28, 28, whatever, and you get the idea. You have to do the, these sorts of things, but it's sort of just the reality of working this out. Okay, I can't remember what the exact answer is. The exact answer is not that important. It's the process of doing this, but okay, like you can definitely multiply 28 by 28, get that result, 
And um, you know, it'll be much larger than 53, so it'll end up wrapping back around. So it'll be a number between zero and 52. And you can sort of continue this process, determine three to the 16, determine three to the 32, and take this number, this number, this number, multiply together, and you'll have your result. Is the general idea okay? Cool. And so another um, simplification technique that you should be aware of, and well, so it's more than a simplification technique, it has a wide variety of uses, um, is Fermat's little theorem, okay? And it says that for any prime p, a to the p is equivalent to a modulo p. Okay, and this only works when p is prime. <clears throat> Another way of saying this, um, in the case where A is not a multiple of P, i.e., since P is prime, it's the same as saying the greatest common divisor of A and P is 1, then um, A to the exponent P minus 1 is equivalent to 1 modulo P. Okay? And you can see, how do you get from the first expression to the second expression? Like, how did I go from this expression to this one? Yeah. Okay. So you say we divide by A, and it certainly looks like that's the case. Okay. But as we'll investigate, uh, maybe a little today, but mostly on Tuesday, there is no concept of division in modular arithmetic. Okay. Uh, because for division to exist, you have to be able to think about things like, uh, you know, rational numbers, which we don't have here. Everything is just some integer, right? So we don't have the idea of uh, division, and so we'll, we'll redefine what it means to divide, quote-unquote, by a number in just a second. Um, but I, so it's not quite that we divided by A. Okay, but it does certainly look like that. And you should, that's the sort of thing you want to be thinking of. Okay, and so we can use this in some problems when we need to simplify things. Okay, so for example, it tells you 5 to the 6 in modulo 7 is equivalent to what? So modulo 7, what does 5 to the 6 evaluate to? Any ideas? It's just 1, right? We're just using the second expression um, here, because uh, P minus 1 is 6, because P is 7, A is not a multiple of 7, 5 is not a multiple of 7, so that sort of thing falls through. <coughs> what if we wanted to evaluate 25 to the 6 mod 7? Same thing holds, okay, because A is not a multiple of P, so we can still say this is 1 mod 7. Okay, where this... Um, can become slightly more useful is what if I asked you what's 5 to the 9 mod 7? Well, then I can't directly just say that it's equivalent to uh, 1, but I can make some simplifying steps. Okay, I can say this is equivalent to 5 to the 7 times 5 squared. Correct? Because 9 is just 7 plus 2. And by the first expression of Fermat's little theorem, 5 to the 7 is just equivalent to 5. Is that clear? So I can just say this is equivalent to uh, 5 times 5 squared. And then make my simplifications from there, right? Um, 5 squared is 25, which is 4 more than a multiple of 7. So I can say this is 5 times 4, which is 20. But that's also 1 less than a multiple of 7. Um, so you can bring this to negative 1 with, or just 6. And so the end result either way you get is 6. What were you going to say? Uh, if A is a multiple of P, so just say I zero mod P. Yeah, so if A is a multiple of P. Like, for example, if we have like 40, equal like 33 equals X mod 7. Sure. So that would be zero, right? It has to be because, like, so you're saying what is 14 to the 23 mod 7? It has to be zero because 14 is a multiple of 7. Yeah. So that's why this case only works when A is not a multiple of P, right? Because 14 to the, to the 22 
is not 1 mod 7, it's 0 mod 7. 14 to the anything will always be 0 mod 7. So that's why the first case holds in general, second only holds when A is not a multiple of P. And since P is prime, that's equivalent to saying uh, the GCD of A and P is just 1. Is that clear? So format to look You'll get 14. But 14 is equivalent to 0 as well. So it also works. Okay, so any questions with the idea of Fermat's little theorem? Okay. And so, I want to walk through an example of a proof that previously we would do with induction or cases or something. But with modular arithmetic, it becomes pretty easy. So, for example, we could look at the proof, prove that 11 to the n minus 6 is divisible by 5. So, you know, one way we could see this written is prove that 5 divides 11 to the n minus 6 for all n in the naturals. Okay, we can do our base case, induction hypothesis, induction step. I believe a proof very similar to this was on the quiz. And you know, this is something that we've become accustomed to now. But now with modular arithmetic, this is equivalent to showing... 11 to the n minus 6 is equivalent to 0 mod 5. <coughs> is that clear? And while 11 to the n minus 6, I know 11 and modulo 5 is just equivalent to 1 because it's 1 more than a multiple of 5. So I can say this is 1 to the n minus 6, but 1 to the anything is just 1. So this is 1 minus 6, which is negative 5, which is 0, and we're done. And that's just as valid as the same proof using induction. But it allows us to use the power of modular arithmetic to make these uh, sorts of proofs a little simpler. Is this okay? Any questions with this? And so here, the key idea was that we could say 11 is just equivalent to 1. Any questions? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. That actually would have made it come out even quicker. Yeah, we could have just instead said 1 to the n minus 1, and you're done. Yeah, because 6 is equivalent to 1. <coughs> Good catch. Any other questions? Okay. Um, so this is a proof that I don't think we have time to finish right now. Um, this is in the textbook, though. If you scroll to the very bottom of the new 3.2 section, chapter 3.2, this exact proof is there. Okay, so I'd recommend you take a look at it. But really, all it boils down to is, uh, you know, prove any odd squares of the form 8K plus 1. That's equivalent to showing that if n is odd, then n squared is equivalent to 1 mod 8. And there are really just four cases you have to consider, 1, 3, 5, and 7. Because 0, 2, 4, 6 all correspond to the even numbers, so you only have to look at the cases modulo 8 of 1, 3, 5, and 7. Right, because if I look at 8k, 8k plus 2, 8k plus 4, and 8k plus 6, that's even, that's even, that's even, and that's even. Because they can all be written as two times something. So the only cases I end up having to look at are 8k plus 1, 8k plus, um, maybe I should use a different variable than k. Um, like, for example, 8c um, plus 1, that should be 8c, 8c plus 1, 8c plus 2, 8c plus 4, 8c plus 6. Those are all even. I look at 8c plus 3 plus 5, and plus 7. So you end up just having to evaluate those four quantities squared modulo 8, and they all come out to 1. And you can see 1 squared is 1, 3 squared is 9, which is 1, 5 squared is 25, which is 1 more than 24, which is 1, 7 squared is 49, which is 1 more than 48, which is also 1. Okay, 
Um, that was pretty quick, but I recommend you take a look at the textbook chapter because it walks through that a little more in depth. Okay. An interesting property I want you to think about is this idea of the cancellation law. Okay. In standard arithmetic, you know, the regular number system we're accustomed to, the cancellation property says that if A, B, and C are real numbers where C is not equal to zero, I can cancel the C's and I'm left with A is equal to B. Okay? So what I want you to think about is does that also hold true in modular arithmetic? How many people think it always holds true in modular arithmetic? How many people think it does not always hold true in modular arithmetic? How many people aren't thinking? Okay, I'm with you. Okay, um, so it turns out in modular arithmetic, it doesn't always hold true. Okay, so for example, consider 2 times 6 and 3, um, sorry, 4 times 6 modulo 12. Is that clear? Do you agree 2 times 6 is 12, which is 0? And 4 times 6 is 24, which is also 0? So 2 times 6 is equivalent to 4 times 6 mod 12. But are 2 and 4 equivalent in mod 12? No, right? So you see the cancellation law doesn't always hold. Okay? And... Another thing to sort of get you thinking is that when we have real numbers um, A, B, and C such that AC is equal to BC, the way you can show that A is equal to B is that you can divide both sides by C, right? And that's why we have the condition C is non-zero because I can divide by C if it's non-zero and I'm left with A is equal to B. But here you notice what this is telling me and as I mentioned before, there's no concept of division, but the sixes, when I'm multiplying them, have this weird property in that it changes the structure, of the, it changes the equality, right? Two and four were equal, but now I multiply them by six. Six is not the zero element, but it still changes the equality. Okay, so that's something you want to start thinking about. But it turns out it depends on your choice of mod. So, for example, if we looked in mod five, the cancellation property would hold, Okay. So if AC is equivalent to BC in mod 5, it would imply that A is e equivalent to B mod 5. So you notice in mod 12, it doesn't necessarily hold. But I'm telling you in mod 5, it does hold. Okay? And so what you might want to start thinking about is what's special about 12 that doesn't happen to 5? Or what, sorry, what's special about 5 that's not true of 12? And... Are you going to say it? Don't, don't say it if you're going to say it, because we'll talk about it um, probably next week. Okay, but there's a semi-obvious property that you can notice about 5 that is not true about 12. Okay? And so that, uh, just as a quick introduction, will lead us into the idea of division. Okay? And in our regular sense of numbers, division is really just the idea of multiplying by a multiplicative inverse. Okay? Just as if, or just... Um, like in addition, the ad additive inverse of a number is just the other number you add by to get zero, right? The inverse of three in addition is just negative three because three plus negative three gets me to zero, right? And that's why the additive inverse of any number A is just negative A because A plus negative A gives me zero. Just like in multiplication, the inverse of a number, if that number is non-zero, is just its reciprocal. Because number times its reciprocal gets me to one. And one is the identity element in multiplication. So identity add is zero. The identity in mult is one. 
And so what we do is multiply both sides of our expression if I wanted to solve for 3x is equal to 14, so forgetting the modular arithmetic for a second, I can multiply both sides of the expression by the inverse of 3, right? And that's how I'm able to cancel out um, the 3 on the left-hand side. And I get my result is x is equal to the inverse of 3 times 14. Well, the inverse of 3 is just fancy for saying 1 over 3 times 14 because we're looking at multiplication. Okay, so... Really what we're doing by dividing on both sides is we're multiplying by the multiplicative inverse on both sides. <coughs> and so the question is, we don't have this idea of one over x. Right here, the inverse of three was just one over three. But in modular arithmetic, we don't have one over anything. So we have this new idea of finding multiplicative inverses in modular arithmetic and the inverse will just be another number. Right? So for example, if we're dealing modulo 5, the inverse of 2 ends up being 3, which is a weird concept because you're used to inverses either being the negative of that number or 1 over that number. Okay? And so how exactly they're found and when they exist, we'll start talking about that kind of thing um, on Tuesday. <coughs>